Uh, welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Mark Skelsey and I am the Special Rate Variation Project Manager here at Willoughby City Council and I'm your facilitator tonight. So welcome very much to, to the webinar. Um, I would just like to quickly run through uh, tonight's agenda. Uh, we're going to be starting off with some introductions and housekeeping. Um, before we run through a presentation on why council is investigating for rate rise options. Um, and then we're gonna be going through the, the detail of those options. So that, that'll take around uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, after the presentation, we're gonna have a good amount of time for an open microphone and online question and answer session, where we'll be listening to your comments uh, and answering your questions um, before we're wrapping up for the night. So just going through the housekeeping, some of the technical aspects, which we'll go through again later in the evening, but we'll just go through them quickly now at the moment. So as we've mentioned, we'll have a presentation. Uh, then there'll be an open mic Q&A. Just at that stage, um, please raise your virtual hand uh, on Zoom if you'd like to talk. Uh, then we will, uh, I'll mention that we want to talk to you. I'll mention your name. We'll then unmute you and you can ask a question verbally and then we will seek to answer it. Uh, please let us also know your name and suburb at that time. It's helpful for other people uh, on the call as well. At that time, there will also be the opportunity to ask questions uh, using the Zoom question function. And we will also seek to verbally answer these questions as well at that time. So you don't only have to answer your questions uh, verbally. Of course, we ask that comments and questions be respectful, as I know that um, working here, the engagement process uh, usually is. And I would say that if your comments or questions are not related to the rate rise options, uh, it's probably better that you uh, raise these using uh, our customer service request system. We can provide a link tonight uh, if need be for, for those, because we really are here today, tonight to talk about rate rise options. Uh, just confirming our council representatives on screen tonight. We have the mayor, Tanya Taylor here, uh, our CEO, Deborah Just, and myself as well. And I'm very happy now to hand across to the mayor to undertake an acknowledgement of country and some introductory remarks. Thank you so much, Mark. And so at Willoughby City Council, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we gather and uh, which we come to from online, uh, the Gamaragal people and their connections to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including those who may be in attendance this evening. Now, I'd also like to welcome everyone, of course, to this webinar, and I really do appreciate you coming online and joining us. Tonight, we're going to be discussing four rate rise options which have been presented to the Willoughby community under the promotional banner of securing Willoughby's future. Now, these options are designed to help councils' financial sustainability and to respond to a growing and changing population and increasing community expectations. That's why it's important to discuss and explain these options with the community at tonight's webinar and at future sessions. And I'd also, as I said, like to thank everybody for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join with us tonight and participate. Uh, we're looking forward to your feedback. Now we're also, as I mentioned, holding nine further in-person engagement sessions over the next two weeks. And of course, running an online Have Your Say survey which has already received over a thousand responses, which is fabulous. Now, um, I'd like to hand over to Deborah Just, our CEO, who will be delivering tonight's presentation. Thanks, De Deborah. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Bit, um, bit trigger happy on the button tonight, so <laughs> I'll have to slow it down a bit. So we'd like to, to begin by talking about the challenges and the environment that we're operating in. Um, no surprise, of course, to yourselves, you would also be experiencing inflation. So up 12.1% in the past two years. Extreme weather events have also um, 
visited uh, Willoughby first with a series of storms and then with localised flood flooding. And they've done damage to retaining walls and to roads and also to our drainage system. So, and we expect this to continue in terms of flooding and heat waves, drought, and also the impacts of bushfire. So just some examples of some of those impacts of wild weather and bearing in mind it's not cyclonic and it's not mass riverine flooding, but still does a lot of damage as we can see here at the outpost with the washout of the road and the collapse of stormwater channel as well. Returning back to our challenges, we have also had some surprised uh, cost increases with very little notice from the state government. So the emergency service levy went up an additional $487,000 um, in 2023-24. Similarly, we had a surprise with the cost of elections skyrocketing up 100000 in that same year. Another cost uh, relates to employee costs with a mandatory award increase. Uh, the council does not set the, um, the wages for staff. It's set centrally by um, local government New South Wales. We do not, of course, begrudge staff a wage increase, but we do need to be able to fund them and to afford them. This is how, of course, all your services are delivered and most of your projects and capital works. So 4.5% in the first year, 23-24, 3.5 in 24-25, and 3% in 25-26. So we've lost, looked at the cost challenges and now we turn our attention to income, the other part of the equation. So during the COVID years, Council lost over $20 million in revenue. We were required to give rent relief to our tenants. Um, we also had to close revenue generating facilities like the Willoughby Leisure Centre. We waived fees as a gesture of goodwill to businesses, to community groups and to sporting associations to help them come back post COVID. And we also saw significant changes in consumer behaviour. So um, we saw uh, fewer people attending uh, events, for example, fewer people using our parking stations, more people working from home and staying fairly close to home. Another source of income has been the rate cap, and it is widely known that the rate cap is just not keeping pace with the increase in costs. So it's no longer covering the costs of services and infrastructure. So for the two years, in 21-22, the rate cap was only 2%, and in 22-23, 2.1%, so a very small increase. This also coincided with Council ceasing its seven-year infrastructure levy, which helped us to address our backlog. What that meant was that Council's revenue dropped by nearly $3 million. Um, a little bit of irony in as much as um, that $38 million per residential ratepayer decrease is a figure that we're going to see uh, a little bit later in one of the rating options. This decision to cease the levy was made on the basis of low inflation forecasts. And I think you'll be well aware that the Reserve Bank of Australia has massively underestimated inflation and they're the benchmark figures that we were projecting on. So let's have a look at this shortfall then between um, the rates and inflation. What you can see on screen for three years is the annual inflation increases. So in 2020-21, it was 3.8. The following year, it was 6.1%. And in 22-23, it was 6%. Conversely, if we look at what the annual rate increase or decrease was during that time, you can see a gap and a widening gap through time. So in the first year, it was 2.6% was the rate increase in comparison to inflation running at 38 The second year, 2%, inflation running at 61 And in the third year, which was the year that we came off the infrastructure levy and rates dropped, you can see the gap widening there to 11.2%. So over those three years, there is a cumulative gap of 16.5% between inflation and the rates that were charged. The other pressures that we have to our um, growth and community expectations. Now, growth wouldn't be an issue in its own right 
if rates were actually able to cover the costs of services and infrastructure, which, as you can see from that increased gap between inflation and the rate peg, um, we've been unable to do. So over that 20-year period from 2016 to 2036, obviously the later years of projections, we were anticipated to grow by 12%. So shifting from about our current population of about 77,000 through to about 88,000 people. That population is not just growing, of course, it's changing in its profile and with that the demand for various types of services and an increasing demand for an increased variety of services. Working from home has also had an impact. You might have read the news reports during COVID that the North Shore of Sydney was the work from home capital for Australia. Um, and that has uh, continued in terms of working from home uh, in our local government area and other areas on the North Shore. What that means, of course, is that there are more people using our services and facilities and also more people observing them. The population has changed, so we've got an ageing of 50 plus, so up 30%, significant increase since 2016. And a lot of those people are the parents of the 5 to 17 year olds. So shifting from that kind of younger uh, cohort of children, preschoolers, through to primary and secondary school age. Our diversity is also increasing with the number of overseas born uh, increasing and with that uh, the cultural diversity um, demands for a language interpretation um, are also reflected. So community expectations, so the community has told us through the last two surveys that their overall satisfaction with council services is quite high. The most recent one of those was in late 2022 with a 95% satisfaction rating. What we are experiencing though is growing community expectations for further increases in service levels. And we're public, uh, we are hearing that particularly in relation to public area maintenance and tree and vegetation maintenance. So if we focus in now on our capacity to fund our service and our day-to-day -day operating um, costs and expenses, we can see along the bottom axis there the years, the financial years from 2016-17 on the left-hand side through to a forecast in 2027-28. On the um, vertical axis, you can see millions of dollars in terms of operating result. So in the pre-COVID years, those three years, Council recorded a $48 million in surpluses. So we were running in surplus. Those surpluses were placed in reserves for major community projects such as the Willoughby Leisure Centre. During the COVID period, as we've said, we lost over $20 million in income. This was the same time that the infrastructure levy came off and rates declined and the same time of which we were hit with the repair bills from the wild weather and storms. So we can see a declining financial position. When we come into the forecast for the next three years, um, we are looking at the impacts of inflation. It did peak at 7.8%, it's annualised at 61 So that's forcing up costs, which you'd be well aware of in your own right. And again, that cost shifting, that rapid and surprise costs of 587000 that have been passed on from state government. And they're not the sole costs that we've experienced. I talked earlier about those mandatory employee costs, which you can see are adding pressure to the operating result, meaning that our long-term financial plan indicates ongoing deficits without intervention by council. So if we have a look at what we've done, so we have undertaken a number of practices over many years starting with one in June 2015, to cut our costs, to be more efficient. In that period, we reduced the number of directors and managers, and that brought a saving of $2 million per annum without any changes in the service standards to the community. We've also kept ourselves honest in terms of very modest or limited growth in um, staff. We also don't fully fund now 
the staff own budget, which means that we have to return a dividend of 7.7%, so about $3.9 million each year, by very carefully managing our natural vacancy rate. I would also say that when there is a vacancy, we do not automatically fill it. We review that position. We work out where else we might need that resource in the organisation. So we've worked fairly systematically not to automatically put people on and to bring ourselves a discipline with that. We've used surplus vacancies, for example, to create new positions we, knew we need like business improvement to keep us efficient. So this really helps us manage our staffing costs. There are also other things with underperforming services and I know cuts to services are never popular with the community. But when you've got something like the loop bus, which gen doesn't generate any in um, income and was averaging just two to three passengers per average trip at a cost of $345,000 a year, it makes sense to cease that service. We have other services where there are alternative service providers um, which are making losses. Again, um, it makes sense to rationalise these. For example, the schools have moved into out-of-school hours care. There are also community and uh, for-profit providers of those services. The demand has also decreased for both uh, childcare services and out-of-school hours services because of the working from home trend. So parents use to lies uh, uh, on average fewer days for those services, which challenges their viability. We have closed the Bales Park Ush and the Chatswood Ush will close in December 2023. It provides us with opportunities also to generate alternative sources of revenue, for example, leasing out the Bales Park space to another Ush provider. And that saved us around $80,000 a year. So councils made some hard decisions, which may not be popular with all sectors of the community, but it's balanced out alternative providers whether it's a business that's core to council um, and um, the numbers of families or, or beneficiaries for it. We uh, have events which have a significant impact, a positive impact on our businesses by generating income, also bring the community together in terms of celebrations and add vibrancy and life to our local centres and to our CBD. We swapped out of Vivid and into a more diverse program of events with wider appeal, a mixture still of public programs and also of paid events, and that saved us $174,900. We also get significant grant funding for our events. So we had $1.2 million, for example, in grant funding last year. Libraries are an example that I talked about earlier about really examining whether we need to continue at the current staffing rates, whether we can do that through improved processes or technology or alternative ways of providing the service. So libraries, for example, have um, had a reduction of five positions since 2017 without any reduction to the community ser um, service standards. And that's netted a, a benefit um, two ratepayers of just under half a million dollars, again, without visible change to services. So these are some of the examples of things that we've done. We can also continue services, but shift from being the provider of the services, which is what council has done in terms of the Devonshire Street Child Care Centre. So up and, um, you know, through from the 1980s, that centre made a loss of cumulative loss of 3.9 million. And in 21-22, which was the last full year prior to COVID, it made a loss of $364,000. So in June this year, council resolved to support a 10-year lease to a private operator. That agreement will be worth $3 million of income to council. It means that the childcare service will continue, but it also means that council avoids a loss of a further $2 million. So is this peculiar to Willoughby City Council, this environment? No, by no means. It's a systematic problem for the whole of the local government sector because the rate cap is not able to cover the costs of services and infrastructure, particularly 
in volatile or inflationary environments, such as the one that we're experiencing currently. So 29 councils in recent terms have applied for special rate variations and another 86 for another form of variation, the additional rate variation. If we look at what that might mean, focusing in on some uh, of the Sydney Metro councils, you can see a range of councils there. If you bear in mind that the top option that we are putting out to consultation is a 20% increase, you can see that's very much at the modest scale in comparison to those increases that you can see on the screen there. The other thing that we needed to do was clearly communicate to the community our changing circumstances. We produced a 10-year long-term financial plan and forecast, which we now review annually and exhibit. This clearly showed that by mid-2025-26 financial year, we were going to be having financial challenges which would also mean that we couldn't maintain the infrastructure benchmarks that are set for us by the Office of Local Government. That document at that time envisaged two rate options, one at 18.5 and one at 23.5. That compares with three rate options of 12, 15 and 20, which are the current options which we will look at later. It canvassed those as special rate variations and it also said because the environment is so volatile financially, we have so much impact from changing weather patterns and a growing and increasingly diverse community with increased expectations that just trying to break even was really placing us at a position of risk. So we flagged alterations to the operating performance ratio, which if you like is a way of seeing if we're living within our means. So if you strip away things, counting of treatments like depreciation, and you strip away um, projects and capital works, this is, is our income coming in to generate, you know, to pay for our services, um, our, uh, any contractors or consultants we have, our, our cost of materials, for example, and you divide it by how much is going out, so incoming versus going out. The New South Wales benchmark for you know, business as usual stable times, certainly prior to COVID, was to break even at zero. We're proposing a 2% margin. Um, we are still using the exceptionally conservative inflation rates of the RBA bank. And this 2% was successfully utilised by Hornsby Council in their recent um, SRV variation, which shows that IPART, which is the decision maker around special rates variation, is well aware of the volatility um, in current circumstances. So what did Council do after it had been to consultation? We received 23 submissions and community feedback, not um, unexpectedly, seeking for lower rate rises and to reduce expenditure in, um, instead of a rate rise. Council also responded, uh, uh, sorry, considered how can we best respond to our growing community expectations, our population changes and the increasing diversity of our population. And from those considerations arose the rate rise options that we're now looking at. So Council confirmed that in August 2023 this year to commence engagement on the four rate rise options. I underline and underscore that Council has not resolved to seek a special rate variation. It has only resolved to go out to engagement, which is the process we're now engaged in. So now drilling down in terms of the four rate rise options. Just to give a little bit of context to start with though, you'll notice that Willoughby has the second lowest um, average residential rates in Northern Sydney, the lowest being North Sydney. However, it's not quite like for like because North Sydney's figures exclude both their infrastructure levy and their environment levy. Whereas Willoughby's figures, for example, include our environment levy. So a low residential rate. The picture changes a bit when we look at the average business rate. You can see Willoughby highlighted there 
um, with ride and, of course, the whole Macquarie Park infrastructure sitting there. It's not surprising that Willoughby is high because of the vibrant CBD, um, both at Chatsford and also St Leonard's and the local centres. But if you take out just two of our top-end ratepayers, Chatsford Chase and Westfield, you strip out about 6,700 from that average, which accounts for about 10%. Now, clearly, Council is very concerned that businesses are able to afford any rate increments in these high inflationary times, just as it is with residential ratepayers. So when we look at the distribution of rates, what we can see here is that more than half of the ratepayers, 52% of the business ratepayers, pay less than $2,000 in rate per year. So we're comfortable that those with uh, higher turnovers um, are the ones that will be bearing the higher rates, but the small businesses um, will be paying at that lower end. So a bit of context there around our residential rates and also our business rates and how they're distributed. So let's look at the rate rise options. So there is one which says just use the rate cap. Now throughout the presentation we've assumed that the rate cap will be 3.5%. Now, IPART doesn't actually announce that until late May, June um, each year. So it's assumed as the figure on the way through the presentation. To maintain services is a 12%. So this is just catching up with inflation and doing what we do now. We can increase our services in relation to the demand, which has a 15%, or we can also build in further margin for further infrastructure at 20%. So if we drill those down and see how they're built up. What we can see here in um, this diagram is we can see the components. So this is a rate peg only at 3.5%. So again, just reaffirming that every time the 3.5% is mentioned, it's an estimate, an anticipated guesstimate, if you like, of what IPART's going to do with the rate peg. But we've also committed to do our part by finding another half a million dollars in revenue and this requires us to cut costs of 2.8 million, which means cut services. It's not cutting um, significantly projects and capital um, uh, works per se, although they will be impacted. This is about the day-to-day -day operating costs that come from the rates that generate all the services. And you'll see this one has no margin for error in terms of the volatile financial weather and community demands components. When we look at the next option though, this is the one to try and address inflation. This and the next three options all have an SRV of varying amounts. They all have a commitment by council to find another million dollars in revenue to take pressure off ratepayers and also to take further pressure off by finding another million dollars in service efficiencies. This two million, it travels through all the next two options as well. We said in the presentation we wanted an operating ratio or margin of at least 2% to deal with that volatility. And this one is comprised of an 8.5% SRV and the rate peg. If we have a look at option three, how it differs from option two is just an additional $2 million for services. So this increased demand around service levels could be catered for under this scenario. And then the last scenario said, says, basically, if you want to go on um, refreshing and renewing community infrastructure, then at 20%, $2.5 million would flow from this option in addition to the 2 million in maintenance. And again, remembering the cost cutting commitments and the revenue commitments travel throughout. So just drilling a little bit more on each of the options. So this is the, the cut the services to balance council's budget. Just as a quick rule of thumb, this would mean cutting about 30 staff positions um, and the commensurate services that they would provide. So you've seen how that was packaged, but this is what happens to our operating result. As you can see, it's highly volatile. In 24-25, there's a $1.38 million deficit um, goes into surplus, flows back into deficit, goes into minus surpluses as part of it. And what that shows is that under this projection, four out of the five 
uh, sorry, four out of the nine years will be in deficit and we will still have an average deficit over that nine year period. So what is the pros and cons of this option? So it means that we stay within the rate peg um, and that council will be living within its means. What are the downsides of this option? Quite clearly, it'll mean reducing or cutting services to the community, and it will also challenge the timely renewal of assets. It certainly means we have absolutely no buffer for the financial shocks, such as continuing high inflation, extreme weather events, or our future diverse growth. We honestly believe that probably within a couple of years we would be back before the community looking for a rate peg rise. You can imagine too that with this volatility, it will make it much harder to attract and retain staff. And this has been an issue for us, of course, in the very tight labour market of recent years, which we've just managed to stabilise. Now, what does that mean in terms of dollars? So what you can see across the top here is the residential rate in yearly and weekly figures, same for the general business, and then for the businesses in the CBD yearly and um, weekly. If we go through to the bottom line, this is all by the SRV. And if we look at what the average residential rate will be, you can see 73 cents a week or $38 per year. That $38, um, as I flagged earlier, is about commensurate with the drop in uh, rates off the infrastructure levy. You can see that general businesses would pay $4.38 a week and that businesses in the CBD would pay $5.25. So those businesses are probably giving up a cup of coffee a week. If we look at the second option, which is really just catching up with inflation at 12% uh, and giving us a buffer, you can see it turns all the years to uh, a surplus, nine out of nine, and we would build a 5.22 million average surplus on um, over those years, yes. which can be utilised, um, obviously, to maintain our services. So this catches up. It allows us to continue those highly valued services to the community. We saw the surpluses in all nine years. Um, we would be able to build, I think, more responsive customer response services and systems. It gives us that buffer. Uh, the capacity to maintain and renew community assets and it would provide a far more stable environment for attracting and retaining the staff that we need to deliver our services and our projects and our capital works. The cons for this option and the other two options are that we will be above the rate peg. So what does that mean in dollars again for residential? $2.50 a week, for businesses in general $5.15, and for the CBD businesses, $18 a week extra in rates. Focusing now on option three, the 15% increase, which is the one that will give the noticeable uplift in public area maintenance. So its point of difference from the previous option is this $2 million in maintenance. It also delivers operating surpluses in nine out of nine years and just under $5 million in average surpluses which can be placed in services and community infrastructure. So the kinds of things that we've been getting feedback on as a council that um, that additional services money might go towards is additional cleaning or cleansing of our public areas, such as our centres, the mall, care and beautification projects around, you know, things like it might be garden beds um, in, in parks or in public spaces, uh, cleaning up our cycling and walking routes, you know, because things like nuts and pebbles or um, leaves are, can be a bit of a treacherous hazard for both cyclists and people who are walking and it would allow us to clean those more frequently. And same with our town centres. And importantly, we know that um, the volatility of the weather and increasing height um, in urban centres means that urban tree canopy is a far more value, uh, valuable and that we'd like to roll that out, not just for amenity purposes, but also for climate amelioration. And then, as we said, we get to maintain the current services as well as improving them. Again, it's going above the rate peg in terms of the cons. So the dollar value then in terms of um, average rate increases, weekly rate here, so yearly for residential is 163, 
$3.13, so creeping up towards a cup of coffee residentially. Business, eighteen eighty two, And CBT business is $22.50 a week. So the last option here, option four, which is the 20% increase, which allows for increased services and also to accelerate our community infrastructure. So its point of difference from option three is this additional 2.5 million. Like um, the other two rate peg options, they're designed to give us a positive um, rating result, sorry, operating surplus result. And again, average is around 5 million average surplus for additional services and infrastructure. With feedback around some of the ideas for that $2.5 million um, acceleration of infrastructure could be, for example, the upgrades of our sporting pavilions and club rooms, um, which are looking a little tired, rolling out more cycling and walking paths, renewing our park furniture and playground facilities, completing the upgrade of the Doherty Centre. So we've done a partial upgrade there, which makes the pieces that are still to be done look even daggier with the, with the lovely upgrade that's been done there and well used and loved by the community. Or closing the funding gap that we have around the Gore Hill Indoor Sports Facility. And of course, the increase in services. Again, the cons are that rate increase at a level higher than the New South Wales government rate peg. So what does that look like in terms of average rate increases? So 218, so this is the top option in terms of 20%, $218 per year for the average residential rate or $4.19, ranging through to $1,500 approximately for businesses in the CBD or $30 a week. So just bringing that all back into one summary slide, just to give you a moment to, to pause on that, that slide as to how the options are built. So the reducing services, which is cutting services, 12%, um, which allows us to basically catch up with inflation and ma maintain current services, 15%, which sees an injection of a further $2 million into maintenance, and then option four was the $2 million in maintenance plus increased community infrastructure along the lines that we've talked about. Each of those options that involve the SRV involve that $2 million in cost case cutting and or revenue and a bit of a safety buffer as well in terms of the operating surplus. So just to round out this part of the presentation, we did look at alternatives to rate rises and I part also request that we do this. So one of the things is to raise debt, um, but we feel this is very much like a household raising a personal loan to pay for their weekly groceries. The other thing of course, is we do have to rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, because we need to pay the extra interest and principal repayments. So that means some services and community infrastructure would need to cease to enable those repayments. So neither timely nor viable. We could sell assets and we will always look to maximise the value of assets and also to dispose of assets where they're not providing either a community or a strategic function for council. However, it is not an ongoing source for our day-to-day -day operations. It's not going to help, help us in perpetuity, pay for salaries, pay, pay for bills and cover the costs of services. Similarly, government grants. So last year in total, we pulled in $16 million of government grants and we've done very well over the last three years with some um, figures around that and slightly higher. But this is not a guaranteed or stable form of income. And it is usually tied to building new assets. What that means is we also then have to stump up the money for the ongoing maintenance bur burden. So it doesn't help us close the gap between our income and our costs. It adds maintenance costs. The other thing is, yes, we do have some healthy internal reserves, but 91% of those reserves are quarantined for a specific purpose. Those reserves help us build significant community infrastructure, like for example, the Willoughby Leisure Centre. They also provide the, the working capital that we need to pay our bills as they come due. And so if you like, it's a one-off sugar hit, much like selling assets and doesn't help our underlying bottom line. So whilst these things 
um, particularly say government grants or selling assets might have some function and they don't address the underlying function, uh, you know, fundamentals. So at this point, I thank you for um, um, uh, listening in on that background. Um, and I will now hand back to Mark. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, so um, in line with the New South Wales Local Government Act, it is the Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal which is responsible for assessing and determining council applications for special rate variations. We thought it was just helpful to quickly just go through some of the criteria that IPART will consider when it's undertaking this process. Uh, it will be looking at evidence that the community is aware of the need for and the extent of the rate rise um, and very much wants us to undertake a variety of community engagement activities, and we'll explain what are the, some of those are in a second. IPART wants us to um, ensure or to work towards that the impact on affected ratepayers must be reasonable, uh, and we need to consider whether the count community has the capacity to pay any rate increases and also whether it's willing to pay those increases. Uh, we're doing that through the engagement process. We are also going to conduct some separate independent research on that as well. Uh, IPART also wants us to explain uh, and quantify any productivity improvements and cost containment strategies uh, we're being undertaken. And uh, this is clear because um, the, the government wants to see councils take measures to reduce ratepayer impacts through being more productive or efficient uh, as distinct to always turning towards rate increases and Deborah's run through some of the, um, the measures that we've been taking taken in recent years and will continue. Uh, just in terms of the process uh, for the rate rise application, that's quite a table of process there. So there's a, there's a, bit, of, there's a bit of work to be done. Um, I just wanted to focus on two aspects initially. You can see there that in May and June, as Deborah mentioned, we exhibited a long-term financial plan, which um, canvassed two special rate rise options. Uh, and we're currently in the period between 25th September and 5th of November, uh, conducting engagement on four rate rise options. Um, in November, we anticipate the council will need to decide whether it will um, choose a single rate rise option but of course, this is um, very much a decision for councillors. Um, if this option involves a special rate variation, um, council would need to send a letter to IPART stating its intention to apply for a special rate variation at this point. Uh, we would then need to prepare a, a special rate variation application for IPART, and we would need to submit this again after council approval um, around early February uh, next year. And then IPART would then conduct a separate exhibition process uh, in mid, sorry, early to mid uh, 2024 before making a decision on to, as to whether the rates would apply from the 1st of July. So as you can see, it, it's quite uh, an intensive process. Um, and in terms of the, I might just uh, pop to the question, Deborah. Um, got a question here, just confirming the SRV will be adjusted correspondingly if the peg rate is different. Um, I might, yeah, I might ask, yeah. Uh, that is correct. So um, what you look at is the headline figure of um, let's say 12%, 15% or 20% um, because it means that, uh, you know, if the rate peg is lower, um, we're still needing to kind of absorb it if it's lower. Um, a little bit of a win if it goes higher. But that's been the advice we had from IPART, was to look at the headline number and then work with whatever the variation is on the estimate. So we won't be sh shifting, um, you know, so uh, uh, we won't be going 15.1 or, you know, shifting it in that sort of way. It will still be those headline numbers if they're the numbers that council decides to go with off the back of consultation feedback. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, just in terms of the engagement process, uh, uh, as, as probably people on this call would, would realise, uh, there's um, been a, an extensive awareness raising campaign 
Uh, we've sent out letters and a brochure to 30,000 landowners. To date, around 20,000 emails to various databases, both business and residential. Uh, you might have seen some of our pavement stickers out and about. Uh, we've been handing out flyers in various centres and in venues and some translated material uh, in the brochure, the letter and on the website as well. Uh, in terms of the engagement process, uh, well, we're happily collecting many, many submissions already on Have Your Say. Uh, we are going to be holding uh, 10 engagement events in total, uh, including the one tonight and then a further nine in-person engagement events, which are kicking off um, next week. Um, and we've got our engagement hub, which is there, as you can see at our Have Your Say site, where you can learn more about the options uh, you can respond to the online survey and you can use an online calculator to calculate your rates increase. And we are also conducting a, um, a randomly selected survey where we're calling people uh, and that survey will reflect the broader demographics of the Willoughby community and will uh, be run as a companion piece of research alongside the opt-in survey. Uh, we know that our online calculator has been very popular. Uh, we encourage people to use it. The, the link is there. If you have your rates notice handy um, and you know what your rate amount was uh, for 23-24, you can type that number in <clears throat> and it will then inform you uh, how much your rates will go up under each of the four options. And we know that people have found that very helpful to understand um, um, how their rates could change in 24-25. And Mark, I think that... Um is is really important because um, when we're talking broadly we need to use the average rates whereas this allows you to absolutely find out what it means to you thanks deborah um i might just go back to david who's got his hand up online and um may want to ask a question or make a comment so we'll just see if we can get david um back talking hey thanks can you we can hear David loud and clear. Uh, um, what's the general consensus so far in terms of um, yeah, the survey results so far? Can you share what people are thinking at the moment in terms of the four options? No. <laughs> no. Um, I, I think it's bad practice to share uh, the early results. I have a concern that it influences other people's opinion and um, can sometimes lead to campaigns um, that would otherwise not occur. So it's purer not not to reveal that information at this time. Sorry, I was a little bit blunt in answering that, David. But but oh, hello. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I think we're all intensely curious. <laughs> we do have an online question here from Michelle. Uh, curious to know how does Willoughby's four proposals reduce services fifteen, twelve, and twenty percent? compare with other nearby councils such as North Sydney, Lane Cove, et cetera? I'm not sure, Deborah, if you want to. Um, so I think this means um, probably uh, going back, the only real slide we have was the average residential um, rate coming up for future years. And you could see there that Willoughby was number two uh, with North Sydney, but North Sydney didn't have its... Um, its environment levy or um, infrastructure levy included in it. So that's your best guide, uh, is the fact that we're sitting down there as um, second lowest. So I'll just check if we've got any more questions uh, at all coming in from uh, people who are online. Doesn't seem to be. I note that Councillor Robert Samuel and Anna Greco are online, so thank you for joining us. Uh, we have another question from Michelle. My, what's my my question is what other councils are proposing in terms of rate rises? Um, thank you, Michelle. Sorry for misinterpreting that. If I can hand over to Stephen Navin, our Chief Finance Officer. We know that Hornsby we'll be getting a rate increase from the 1st of July this year. So we're just wanting to know, um, Stephen, which other councils do we know that have a rate rise in 
or intending a rate rise. So Hornsby is one. Karingai has also got one coming online, I think, after the next election. So thank you, CEO. Um, Karingai is the only one we're currently aware of, and they will be putting theirs forward in 2025-26. Um, uh, there are um, a number of other councils who are examining their current financial position but haven't yet shown their hand on whether they're going for. Uh, that's NESROC councils, but as uh, Mark mentioned in one of the earlier slides, or, or sorry, Deborah mentioned one of the earlier slides, I think there's around 19 across New South Wales right now uh, applying in this round and 32 in the last round was my recollection. And certainly the increment was modest, if you recall that slide. Um, Michelle, the other thing I think which is um, making our um, neighbouring councils a little bit more cagey, of course, is the upcoming election next year. Um, and, you know, I have to take my hat off to this council to have the courage to deal with the financial sustainability of council and the services and infrastructure it provides to its community in a very sensitive run up you know, to the next election. So I think um, hats off to the councillors for, for facing what needs to be done in the best interest of the community, um, which is not always electorally popular and does require courage. Thank you. I'll just check. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I'll just check if there's uh, any other questions. Because if there's not, we may be able to move towards a close so it doesn't seem so at the moment uh anna councillor greco yes no well, that was quick um <laughs> it seems so so our last slide is the closing remarks of uh, mayor tanya thank you mark and thank you deborah um, and thank you to everybody who has logged on this evening and for those that may be watching this webinar um, after it is live this evening. Um, I really appreciate your commentary and your questions. It's really important that we hear from our community on the issues that matter to them and, and this is a huge issue. Um, as Deborah said, it has been a difficult thing to, to decide to go out for community consultation on a special, potential special rate variation, given the uh, the election coming up in September next year. But it is important for us to look at the longevity of this council and the, the, the future of this council in terms of what we can afford to do. So um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, there's, there has been some great points made and we'll take those that feedback on board as well. And if you have any further questions, I pl please, I do encourage you to write to us or, or put them in your submission. Um, as indicated by Mark, we would like to ensure that everybody will be considering um, this feedback and other feedback we receive. So um, we will be making a decision at the November council meeting, but the feedback will be collated and looked at collectively and uh, a decision will be made at the November meeting. So thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>